a little bit about me. Um, my name is Ella Simon. I am an intern ranger at Big Cypress National Preserve. I've been working here for about four and a half months now, um, and I'm on a gap year. So I graduated high school last year uh, in June, and I decided that I wanted to take a year before going to school, and next year I'll be going to the University of Maryland. But since I was little, I have loved nature. I love being outside. My family and I, would, we would go to Cape Cod over the summers, and we would swim and look for critters while my family was off in the ocean. I'd be searching the ground for crabs and horseshoe crabs and whatever else I could find. And as I've grown older, it's adapted to more sophisticated uh, situations. So I spent my high school interning at the National Aquarium in Baltimore as an exhibit guide. So talking to people, letting them know what we have. Um, but over the last year, I have been to a couple of amazing places. And one of that, one of those places has been here in Big Cypress. I spent two months in Costa Rica over the summer doing turtle and bat research before coming here to spend about six months. I'll be leaving in April. Here at Big Cypress, I get to be outside. I get to be doing the things I love, being in nature. And I wanna share that with people. I, wanna, I want people to be able to come out and experience the same things that I do. So I'm an intern ranger and I work in SWAMP. So SWAMP, the Swamp Water and Me program, is the program where we take every sixth grader in Collier County and we take them out into the swamp and we get them dirty and playing in the water and looking at the alligators and the fish and the great egrets and as many things as we possibly can. For a lot of these kids, they've never been outside. Maybe they've been outside their house, maybe they've been to the pool or to the beach, but many of them don't realize that Big Cypress is in their backyard, that it's out here and they can come to it. You guys can too. It is pretty amazing. But you take the kids out and they get to tromp through the swamp and do experiments and mess around and just be outside. And to me, that's really, really important to be able to get kids screens, out of their houses, and out into nature. But at Big Cypress, there's a lot of things that you guys can do too. So most of you, or I'm assuming all of you at this program, are not sixth graders. So unfortunately, you cannot join us for our swamp. However, there's a lot of, a lot of activities that you can do too. For example, swamp buggies. If you can, you can go out and go on a swamp buggy tour and see Big Cypress from that. You can go bird watching. I don't know about you, but I really love birds and Big Cypress has a lot of them. <laughs> They're pretty awesome. You can go kayaking or canoeing. We have plenty of canals, plenty of rivers, places for you to launch your boat and just be outside in nature. And back to our kids, they get to do dip netting. We do have fishing, we do have hunting in Big Cypress. For the kids, that means they get to dip net. They get to find little critters and really connect to nature, whether that be just being outside in it or maybe falling over uh, to get in the water, but they get to be here and it's pretty awesome. But for our animals here, like our uh, alligator, for like our animals here, like our alligator and our great blue heron, they don't really care about us. They are not here to cater to our whims. When we go bird watching, they're not sitting there so that we can watch them. They're here because this is where they live. This is their home. Like our barred owl, for example. Our barred owl, it does not care that the prairie is a beautiful, beautiful place to be, filled with wildflowers, filled with all sorts of little critters. It simply does not care. All it cares about is getting that field mouse that's running through that prairie. So when we think of Big Cypress, when we think of being out in nature, it's important that we realize that nature in some ways is there for us. It's for us to enjoy. That's why we have a preserve so that we can go out and enjoy, but also for the animals that live there. 
this is their home. This is where they live. This is where they are hunting, where they are breathing, eating, sleeping. So the nature isn't just for us. It's mostly there for the creatures that are living. So this is a map of Big Cypress. And throughout today, I will be asking you to write in the chat. Feel free to do so. Um, for example, how many of you have been to Big Cypress? Feel free to write in the chat. <laughs> for those of you who don't think they have, well, Big Cypress is enormous. It is 729,000 acres big. How we tell the kids, it's 550,000 football fields. It's huge. <laughs> if you have ever driven from Naples to Miami, you've been through Big Cypress. Both Tamiami and Alligator Alley go through Big Cypress. So again, I ask, how many of you have been to Big Cypress before? It's important to realize that Big Cypress isn't just those roads. It's not just Tamiami and Alligator Alley. It is made up of beautiful wildlife, including our hardwood hammocks. Throughout the preserve, we have a whole bunch of different habitats, and they range in elevation. So starting from the top, we have our hardwood hammocks, then going down our pinelands, then to our prairies, our cypress swamps, and finally to our mangroves. What's important to realize is that while the elevations really make the difference between each different type of habitat, the elevation is not that much. If I went home to Maryland and I walked up eight inches on a slope, absolutely nothing would change. Here in Big Cypress, if I walk eight inches up in elevation, I have gone from the Cypress Swamp to a Pinelands. Everything would be completely different. And not only that, not only is all the different habitats completely different from one another and in different elevations, Big Cypress has two different seasons. We don't have a winter, spring, fall, summer. We have the wet season and the dry season. Right now we are in the dry season. So when I go out into the swamp, the water is about up to my knees. When I first got here, when we were about the end of the wet season, the same water in the same place was about up to my chest. The water here in Big Cypress changes greatly in different levels. And it's important to realize the animals here have to adapt to that because I don't know about you, but I personally could not live in water that is up to my chest 100% of the time. Not really something that I as a human can do, but the animals here have to figure it out. So first things first, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about snakes? That's what this presentation is going to be on. So I sincerely hope that you like snakes here. If you are absolutely terrified of snakes, thank you for staying. Good luck, there will be snake pictures. But on a scale of one to 10, feel free to write in the chat, how do you feel about snakes? Me personally, definitely a one. One being the greatest things on the planet. I love snakes. I happened to run across one two days ago and it was one of the greatest experiences I've ever seen. Yeah, you can respect snakes and be afraid of them. You can respect snakes and feel that they are kind of gross and disgusting. But I hope by the end of this presentation that your number will go down. Although if you're a zero, great on you. That is amazing. I hope that during this presentation, if you are one of those in the seven to 10 range, that hopefully you'll be in the three to five, and if you're in the three to five, hopefully you'll be down to the two or three. We'll see if we can get you there. <laughs> now, I'm gonna start with a little video. It might be a little bit laggy, but the point here is, this is what a snake sees when it goes through Big Cypress. It sees branches in the way, it sees water, it sees a whole world that we don't really. I went through the swamp and I took a GoPro and walked for about four hours just on different trails getting underwater footage. And I can tell you that from above ground, you cannot see all of this. 
This just looks like a sea of grass. You cannot see the sticks. You can't see where there's little pathways made by animals. None of that. All you see is water. And speaking of that water, as I mentioned before, we are not as well adapted to the water in Big Cypress. For me, my adaptation to the water could be maybe bringing an extra clothes, an extra set of clothing after work. If I go into the swamp all day, maybe I'll be really uncomfortable if I don't bring an extra pair of pants. For us, our adaptations are ways that we can get around being soaking wet. The snakes, they don't really have that option. So this is our Florida water snake. They are really cool. Here they're representing the category of water snakes that we have in Big Cypress. So they live here. They live here during the wet season and the dry season. And so for them, they have to figure out how to swim. Something that I did not know about snakes until very, very recently is all snakes can swim. When I think of a snake, I think of them slithering along on dry land. Maybe if they're going to bite you, they're coiling it up and striking at you. But our snakes, and all snakes, can swim and do swim. So they're just as likely to be on the water as they are on land. So how many of you have ever seen a snake before in real life? Anyone? Yeah, I see a couple hands being raised. Yeah. Our fish that we have, or our snakes that we have here, don't always eat what we think they do. I always thought that snakes pretty much only ate mouth, mice and maybe small rodents, but our water snakes, they live primarily in the water. So they're gonna have to eat things like crayfish and frogs and lizards and anything else they can get to closer to the water. A lot of fish, I can tell you that. They eat a lot of fish. Like this garter snake. When I first saw this picture, I was fascinating because that's a pretty enormous frog, right? It's pretty big. Our snakes here are well adapted to eat our critters. And while this snake may not be able to swallow down that frog, we do see snakes in the water holding large pieces of fish as they try to gulp them down. It is quite amazing. So this is our water moccasin. And our water moccasin is another one of the snakes that likes to live in the water. It is not a water snake. But as the name entails, it very much likes to live in the water. And they are very good at it. They can hold their breath for up to an hour. I can hold my breath for about two minutes. Very large difference. If I had to hunt in the water, I would be very, very bad at it. These water moccasins, they can just spend their time under the water waiting to strike, waiting for some fish to swim past them, because they can be underwater for more than an hour. It is awesome. <laughs> we have another category of snakes here called our rat snakes. And this video was not taken in Big Cyprus. However, the species of snake here, which is a rat snake, is found here. And it is going to do something fascinating, something that our water snakes have adapted to doing. If you are a water snake and you are sitting on a tree, just living, and all of a sudden you see a hawk or you see a shadow come over you. Well, the fastest way to get away from that hawk is not gonna be to turn around, try to slither down the tree, try to avoid the hawk. Let's see what this rat snake does. He falls out of the tree. Yeah, our water snakes, if near a predator, will simply fall out of the tree and into the water below them. I think this is amazing. <laughs> um, not many animals have a go-to escape mechanism that really works, um, but I can tell you that if there is a hawk that is headed for this snake and heading for that branch and that snake just falls, it's not gonna get that snake. And that snake knows that the water is beneath it and so will simply just fall off the tree in order to avoid the hawk. I have yet to see this, but I, I want to very, very badly. 
What's also important to note is that snakes can't, or most snakes cannot thermoregulate. This means that they can't, if it's cold, they can't make themselves warmer, and if it's warm, they can't make themselves colder. So what that means is they are very dependent on their surroundings, and if they are cold, they have to find a place to heat up, they need to find some sun to lay out in, or if they're really hot, they have to either go into the water, find some shade, but while doing all of this, they have to make sure they're not at risk to be eaten by a predator. So being a snake, very stressful. Your goal is to keep warm, don't get eaten by something else. But they need their areas to be a place, or their habitats to be a place where they can avoid predators, but also keep warm or keep, keep cool. And here in Big Cypress, a big part of that is the hardwood hammocks. As I mentioned earlier, the hardwood hammocks are our highest elevation habitat. This means that they are pretty much dry all year round. But in this case, snakes and humans see this the same way. So while the water we may not be super well adapted to, the snakes love it, but our hardwood hammocks, both of us love. So our hardwood hammocks are where we build things. We build things like roads, like houses. If you live in Naples, you probably live on a hardwood hammock. Downtown Naples, built on a hardwood hammock. All of this because it is difficult to drain the swamp in ways that would, and now illegal, but it is difficult to drain the swamp in ways to put in huge neighborhoods, huge areas of people to be. And so the easiest way to do that was to buy up the land for the hardwood, where the hardwood hammocks were and build up. Now, for the snakes, this can be a problem. All of a sudden, all of their nice dry areas with a lot of hidden nooks and crannies and with food have now been taken over by humans. There's now cars and buildings and all of us. So what happens? Well, our snakes end up in our houses, on our roads, in our pools, wherever. If you live in Naples, you've probably seen a snake around your house or on the road, somewhere around you. They're there. And that's because we've taken over their hardwood hammocks. But not only do we see, big, see the hardwood hammocks similarly to the snakes, the snakes physically see differently than us. So in front of me, I have a rough green snake. And rough greens have pretty big eyes. They're fairly large. They are something called an arboreal snake. And what they do is they stay above ground and they tend to hunt things in trees and on the ground rather than under it. And so what they need to do is they need to see. You and I, when we look at something, we see it in front of us. We have depth perception. We can see exactly where it is. If you need glasses, maybe you need a little help. But we can see in front of us. Our snakes differ in that. So for example, this is our coral snake. And coral snakes have pretty much opposite eyes to the rough green snakes. Our coral snakes, while we do see them above ground, hunt and live a lot of times below ground. And so they don't have much need for eyes. So while our arboreal snakes need really good depth perception to be able to hunt for mice and be able to see where they are, our coral snakes, not so much. If you live underground, you don't need to see. There's no light. How many of you have ever seen a black racer? These are probably the most common snakes that uh, you will see around Big Cypress. Um, uh, black racers, like our rough green snake, have very good eyesight. It's one of the reasons that we see them out and about all the time is because they are out and about hunting. They are out and about doing what snakes do. They're looking for places to hide, looking for food, looking for water, and they're not underground. And they're also not very much in trees. They can go up trees, but they tend to stay more on the ground. 
Now, I want you all to imagine, just for a second, that you are a snake. You are a snake, and uh, you want to catch this mouse. This mouse is unfortunately in a field. I will tell you that in this field right now, there is a mouse. Can anybody see it? How about now? That was really difficult. Uh, I can tell you that I showed this picture to approximately 30 people before I put it into this presentation and nobody could find the mouse. <laughs> Now, if you're a snake and you're going through the prairie and you are trying to find this mouse, it can be very difficult, especially if you only had your eyesight to rely on. They don't, but some of our snakes have a really, really cool adaptation to it. Infrared. So here at Big Cypress, we have some snakes called pit vipers. And pit vipers, like our water moccasin, can see in infrared. So they can see where our mice and our birds and whatever else they're trying to track have been and where they are now by seeing them in a different color. They can register the body heat of an animal rather than just seeing it straight on. So what that means is that that mouse in that field, well, it's not as well hidden for them. They can be able to track where it was just from where the ground is warmer. It's pretty cool. Our other pit vipers are our eastern diamondback. Most of our pit, actually all of our pit vipers are venomous here in Big Cypress, and they make up three of the four venomous snakes that we have. So our eastern diamondback, our water moccasin, and if you look carefully at this picture where the arrows are pointing, there should be two holes on the snake's mouth, or on its nose, I guess. We don't really picture snakes as having holes in its head. When I think of a snake, I think of just a long, elongated head in front of it. But these holes, or pits, are why they're called pit vipers. So these pits are what allow them to be able to see in infrared. They allow them to track these animals without having to see where the animal is at any moment in time. And our last pit viper is our pygmy rattlesnake. They are very small. They are roughly eight inches in size, very, very small. Um, but they are one of our last venomous snakes. But our animals here, like our black racer, like, our, like our, all of our snakes here, aren't just able to see. So while some of them have specialty senses for seeing, or some of them maybe can't see very well, like our coral snake, our snakes can also hear. But they don't hear the way that we do. I'm sure all of you have been to a party before. And how many of you have been to a party where the music playing is very, very loud and you can feel the beat? You can feel it in your body and it's kind of rumbling and it's going. I'm sure we've all felt it before. That's more how snakes hear. They can't hear, oh, you're a cute little snake, or they can't hear another snake talking to them. But what they can do is they can hear larger vibrations. So our Scarlet King snake here, which also happens to be the one behind me, um, our Scarlet King snake, when it puts its mouth on the ground, puts its chin like this, its ears on either side will be able to pick up vibrations that are further away. What this means is that if something is making a loud screeching noise, like say a hawk, it won't be able to hear it. But if a very large predator is walking towards it, like if you start walking towards the snake, it will be able to know that you're there and it will be able to tell you well, it will be able to tell exactly where you are, too. For me, sounds are sometimes harder to pick out exactly where they're coming from, especially if it's more of a vibration than a sound. But for snakes, they can do it very, very well. They not only can hear, but they have another sense of smell that most, or another sense that people are more familiar with, and that is a sense of smell. So when we smell, 
we basically take in particles through our nose and inside our nose, there are a whole bunch of neurons. And what they do is they identify what that substance is that's coming into the nose and tells the brain, oh, that's a rose. Yeah, that is a rose. Snakes do something quite similar. They have a specialty organ in their nose. They don't have noses like us, but do you see this big tongue on the end? That really big forked tongue? Many of you have probably seen a snake's forked tongue before. That is a certain shape for one reason. That reason is to be able to sense where things are. So our snakes, when they're in the water or in the air, can use their tongue to feel the particles. And then what they'll do is they'll take their tongue, put it back in their mouth, and in the roof of their mouth is two different holes. Those holes lead up to something called the Jacobson's organ. The Jacobson's organ will then figure out what the particles are, tell the brain, here are the particles, and the brain will go, oh, there's a mouse, or oh, there's a hawk, maybe we should go hide something along those lines. How many of you have ever had to empty out a fridge before? Because something in it smelled really, really bad. I'm sure we've all done it. And I'm sure, as you know, it takes a long time to figure out what the thing in the fridge is that smells bad. Snakes don't have that problem. If a snake is going along and there's a mouse to the left of the snake, and it sticks out its tongue, flicks out its tongue, and those particles coming from the mouse that say, there's a mouse here, mouse smell, those smelling particles come out of the mouse and land on the left side of the tongue. When the tongue goes back up into its mouth, into those two holes, the brain will recognize that the smell came from the left side. So the snake doesn't have to just go around searching for a mouse everywhere. It can go specifically to the left there is a mouse there. What this means is that unlike us who has to search through every single thing in the fridge, the snake can find the mouse fairly quickly. <laughs> so while I was getting footage for this uh, presentation, I came across a turtle. I don't know if any of you saw the turtle. I'll go back and play it one more time. I had to go through this footage, all of the footage, probably close to 10 times before I saw that turtle. Did not know the turtle was there. I had watched the footage 10 times, had not seen a single thing. On the 10th time, I noticed that there was a turtle. This snake going through the water, it would be able to figure that out much quicker because not only can they smell above the water, they can smell in the water too. So those particles that go up to our nose are usually going through the air. However, for snakes, they smell these particles through water. So the particles that they smell go through the water in the air and then into their nose. And the same principle works while they're underwater. Those same particles go through the water and into their mouth and up to their nose. It's pretty cool. So this is our Eastern rat snake. Also that other snake that fell out of the tree. It's the same one. But our snakes here, they need to use their senses for not just prey and predator stuff. They need to use it for something else. That is fire. If you live in Naples, I am sure that you have seen big clouds of smoke that go over Big Cypress or every now and then come over Naples. And that smoke comes from our fires. And most of the time, our fires are on purpose. They are called prescribed fires. In fact, there's an entire team of people working here in Big Cypress that work exclusively on the fires, creating them, controlling them, and making sure that everything works the way it's supposed to. But for us, for humans, these fires can be an inconvenience. I was supposed to go camping last weekend, and our campground was shut down because of fires. Um, it can be annoying. Sometimes there might be really big clouds of smoke 
and everything smells like smoke for a really long time, whether you're inside your house or outside of your house. Fires can be helpful, but sometimes we don't really like them very much. But for the animals here, it's incredibly important. While for humans, we may not truly want fires, maybe like, eh, maybe we can go without them. We really can't. For the animals here, it is a necessity. So if you're a snake and you are going about your day, swimming along, and all of a sudden there's a fire, you have a couple options. One of which is going under the water, or we can go up a tree. We can flee the fire. We can go lots of places to try and avoid the, the fire. If you are not in Big Cypress, because we don't have them here, but in other places in Florida, gopher tortoise holes are a huge uh, area that snakes can go, and they can go under the ground and hide from the fire that way. When you're in Big Cypress, they have to either go up a tree, a very tall tree that won't catch on fire, or go into the water. Now, here I have two pictures. One is directly after a fire, and one is a couple days later. Just a couple days. Yeah. Our fires, while they can seem incredibly deadly at first, and they can seem that they have destroyed everything, that really isn't the case. On the right, you can see all of that new growth that's growing in that could not have been there beforehand. And if you're a snake and you're uh, trying to find a mouse, that can be very, very helpful. Yes, this mouse is photoshopped in, but the point still stands. A mouse in a prairie or in a pineland that has just been burned can be seen much, much easier by a snake than something going through that prairie that we saw earlier where no one could find the mouse. Uh, which brings me to kind of my next point. Why do we care about snakes? If, I mean, I love snakes. I care about them because they are awesome and amazing and they're so cool. But if you're at this program and you're like, well, I kind of like snakes, but they're just snakes. Don't really matter very much. Here's why. And that answer is all the other animals. So our Eastern Diamondback, well, she can make really, really good food for a hawk. Or maybe he could, or maybe that raccoon could really use a nice snack out of snake eggs. Raccoons are really big foragers, and so when they come across eggs, they will eat them. So for our raccoons, finding a nest of snake eggs is like a Thanksgiving meal. So many eggs for them to eat. Or like our alligators. Our alligators are everywhere. If you live in Florida, you've seen alligators. And those baby alligators, they're not very big, are they? And if we have a fairly large snake, the other day we found a six foot long uh, water moccasin, those baby alligators, real nice meal. All of the animals here in Big Cypress are connected. The Big Cypress food web is enormous. And while this may simplify things a little bit in this web here, you should know that snakes are kind of in the middle. They're not the top predators. There's always things that eat them. And they're not the bottom predators. They like to eat those. And what would happen without the snakes is everything that likes to eat it and all the things that it likes to eat, their populations would go way out of whack. If we didn't have any more snakes, then our hawks might not have enough to eat. And if we had no more snakes in our frog populations, especially our invasive ones like the Cubans, would increase exponentially. So it's important to realize that even if you don't like snakes, even if you're not a huge fan of them, they are incredibly important to the ecosystem. And without them, the whole ecosystem can collapse. But while we do see a lot of snakes, and while their habitat has been degraded just a bit, there are some things that we can do to help them. 
to figure out or to basically keep them alive. And one of those ways is slow down while you're driving. One of the biggest causes of snake mortality in South Florida is cars. Pretty much 90% of the snakes that I have seen while being here have been on the roads. And as I said earlier, it's because they like to bask in the sun and our hardwood hammocks are slowly starting to decrease. But those roads where all of our snakes are, roads like Tamiami, where people go 60 miles an hour, be careful. Try to avoid things on the roads if you can. And if you're going over the speed limit, maybe try to slow down. This is Big Cypress. And in Big Cypress, we have a lot of snakes. And we have a lot of birds. And we have a lot of alligators. And we have a lot of raccoons and bears. And all of the animals here are connected. And so is the nature. And while we look at Big Cypress as a place where we can go to recreate, where I live, where we can go kayaking or go on a swamp buggy or go bird watching. It's important to realize that things do live here. And yes, the birds that we're watching are incredibly cool and the snakes that we found are exciting. They're not here for us. They're here because they simply want to live. They want to catch food, they want to breathe, they want to survive. And we need to be able to respect that when we're going through nature in general, not just in Big Cypress, if you go anywhere, even in your backyards. So on that note, I have a question for you. How do you feel about snakes? Feel free to write it in the chat. I wanna see if there's any difference in, uh, in numbers. I can tell you that before I started doing research for the presentation, snakes were about a three. I really liked snakes, they were pretty cool, but that was it, they were just pretty cool. Now I'm a very good zero, very good zero. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? So most of the pictures I did not take, um, we have a, stash, for lack of a better word, of okay. things that we can use. Great. Um, some of them, like the one that's behind me, um, yeah. I actually had a friend take uh, who works uh, with snakes in Big Cypress, and he sees a lot of them, so he takes some pretty awesome pictures. <laughs> I did not know they were in Florida. I knew that they were in Maryland. We have a lot of them in Maryland. Wow. Um, I have not heard anything about Florida. I can tell you in general, like especially if you're in Naples in a residential area, just leave it be. Um, snakes can be kind of annoying sometimes because they might be blocking the path of where we're going, but just leave it alone. If you're like hiking, um, stop moving and then back up slowly. Uh, most animals take very large movements as a sign of aggression. So, for example, last week I was walking in a very, very tight path in the swamp, and all of a sudden there was a snake right here. That had never happened to me before. I can honestly say the best move at that point in time is to just back up and slowly walk away. Um, honestly, most snakes are not going to attack you unless you attempt something aggressive, like picking it up, trying to poke it, don't poke the snakes, and you'll, you'll most likely be fine. <laughs> yes, there are some native Florida snakes that are endangered or threatened. Uh, one of those is the, uh, indigo snake. It is very endangered, um, and not in Big Cypress, but in other parts of Florida, they are one of the major snakes that use gopher tortoise holes as their means to avoid predators. Um, but yes, there are native snakes that are endangered um, and we're doing what we can. Um, yeah, one of the main things that we can do is quite honestly, slow down when you're driving. I've lived in Florida for four months and I've noticed that most people do not obey the speed limit. 
If we can just slow down, there will be a lot less snake deaths. Any other questions? I have a question, kind of a follow-up to Michael's question. Uh -huh. so thinking about when you take the sixth grade students out into the swamp and when there is standing water that they're going to be wading through, I bet they ask you probably every day, you know, what if there's snakes? What if there's alligators? Is there anything you explain to them to kind of ease their mind? Yeah. Um... One thing I say is uh, I'm more likely to get bitten by one of the sixth graders than a snake. <laughs> um, but also that snake that I was talking about that was right here, I did not find it. Uh, actually, I had led half a group through and in the middle of the group, one of the kids goes, hey, there's a snake here. <laughs> At that point in time, you have a very long group of kids that you need to move away from the snake. And so whenever we go into the water for the first time, we give them a safety talk. We tell them what to do with the snake, if there's a snake. And what we tell them to do is A, don't poke it with a stick. Uh, B, don't scream. If you scream, it'll run away and no one else will see it. <laughs> and three, just back up. Like the snakes don't want, we are way too big for a snake to want to tangle with us. They, they don't want to have to bite us. They don't want to fight us. They know they can't win. So unless we are doing something overtly aggressive, like reaching down and trying to pick it up, they simply won't move. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs>